Mona Lisa is all about me. It's all about you. It's all about our stories. The stories that never get told, but ought to. Whereby water transportation does not make financial sense, it makes economic sense. I was there for two and a half hours on the floor. Nobody attended to me. If we don't take care of the poor, the poor will take care of us. It's about getting at the root of things and hearing from the horse's mouth. We have 15 public hospitals to make them affordable. In the whole of Africa, we are bigger. You know, Nigeria, we sleep, eat, dream, fashion. Those with the uh, financial backing don't see fashion as an investment, which makes no sense. If they do it for free, they won't have money for the next case. Mona Lisa is about real life and the real lives, yours and mine. Make a date with Mona Lisa and together let's ensure that the important stories get told. Welcome to what promises to be another scintillating edition of Moan and Lisa. Excuse the pun, but we'll be reaching for the skies on this episode as we tackle the aviation sector. IATA, the International Air Transport Association, the trade association for the world's airlines and representing some 290 airlines, estimated that profits in all regions apart from Africa in 2019 will be 12.8 trillion naira. Now, according to them, Africa would instead report a loss of about 108 billion naira as a result. Africa is termed the red flag region, of which Nigeria is a main player. Although the continent constitutes about 12% of the world's population, air travel in Africa is only 1% of the global air travel market. Africa is also projected to be the continent with the highest growth potential and is estimated to hit 8.1 billion dollars profit in 2035. This is according to Bernard Aliu, the International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO president. Which figures are we to believe? Mr. Agbenga Olowo, president of Sabre Network West Africa, says that the last time the air travel recorded growth was in 2014. This will make sense in the light of the fact that we are yet to see the unveiling of our national air carrier once again, which last saw the light of day in 2003. Air transport accounts for the second highest share of the transport output at 6 to 7% after road transport, which accounts for as much as 84%. Notably, however, the aviation industry in Nigeria supports 254,500 jobs and contributes 184.7 billion to the national GDP. Nigeria reportedly has 22 federal airports and over 18 aerodromes, over 30 airstrips and heliports, 23 domestic airlines, and of Significance is the fact that Nigeria is an important destination to over 22 foreign carriers with bilateral air service agreements with over 78 countries. This suggests that with a more efficient management and structural reform of this sector, we could see a balancing of the books and a transition from the red to the blue as far as productivity is concerned. Having downloaded all that information on you, all that is left to say is fasten your seatbelt as we literally take you into the cockpit to explore the realities of the aviation sector in our on-site reports. The aviation sector appears riddled with contradictions, significant demand against selective and even unreliable supply. We were privileged to gain access to the cockpit and to the viewpoint of those behind the scenes. We've been cleared for clearance and the clearance is uh, 31,000 feet to Port Harcourt. Good morning ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Eric Air Captain. Chris Najomo, a.k.a. Jolly Papa, and the rest of the crowd. I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome on board our Boeing 737, 700 series aircraft shuttle departing for Kutakot International Airport. If there is anything I or any member of my crew can do to make your flight more comfortable, please do not hesitate to ask. Thank you and welcome on board. Cabin crew, please prepare for departure. Check the radio license, check the airworthiness of the aircraft. All the papers are usually in the aircraft. 
and uh, we're good to go. Once we do that, we check our route, we check that the aircraft has been fueled, we do all our overhead checks and we do that. I call the cabin crew, we usually four cabin crew, we go for what we call a pilot brief with the cabin crew and um, I ask them a couple of questions they've spoken, talk, talked about. My name is Remile Kumbelo, I'm a cabin crew member with ARIC Airline. I've been flying with ARIC for about seven years now and it's been an interesting journey so far. Flying is interesting. For me, it's um, actually a hobby. You know, it's um, making money from what I love to do. Oh, difficult passengers all the time, all the time. Sometimes they're very aggressive and um, such passengers, you, you just report it immediately and such will be the same back. You know, such passengers will not go on that flight. My name is Moe Mitai. I'm a cabin crew, a line trainer with Arik Air. I've been with Arik for about 12 years now, flying. I've grown through the stages from a junior cabin crew to a senior crew member and now a line trainer. What I enjoy most about flying is that there is no day that is the same. For anyone who, who would love to fly as a profession, the first thing I would say is that you must be a very, very patient person because you are dealing with people from different backgrounds. I welcome to my office. This is the uh, 737 Next Generation Cockpit. It's a 700 aircraft. Um, you can see all the um, dials are all like um, TV screens you have here on all the dials. Everything about this airplane is so built in such a way that there's always a backup. If there is bad weather, it will show you here. If there's wind shear, it will say wind shear ahead. One crash that happened in, in, in Abuja, the ADC crash so many years ago. Yes. Um, there were about four aircraft wanting to take off that day and three other airlines said they will wait because the weather was bad. But that very particular airline, ADC, took off. It took off and went into wind shear and brought the plane down. Was that human error? My name is Chris Najomo, your captain, also known as Jolly Papa. For your comfort and safety at the back, I have four cabin executives, including close two delectable chicks and two cute guys. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome and enjoy the Arik hospitality. Cabin crew, let's rock and roll. This is a perspective the average passenger often doesn't get to see and their viewpoint reflects this. I'm here in Lagos last 12 years, but uh, there's no change in the airport. It's still like that. It's, it's little bit, but I think it has to be more improved. They should have more place to sit down for the visitors. If, if you can compare to Accra, Accra is much more better than Lagos. I think there's a lot of improvement and um, we can get better in terms of facilities and all of that way they attend to the clients and the usual attitude we have we're in a queue and somebody comes from nowhere and they just pick him up and they start passing papers to themselves and you know which is what i noticed today the experience today so far has been very good um, especially to do with the ground staff they've been very attentive one of them rallied to my support even without my asking and fast tracked me um, helping me with my special needs children and that has been really pleasant. So far, I'm enjoying the experience. Even though my plane, we haven't boarded yet, which looks like it might be delayed, but you know, we're here. To say there is room for improvement would seem to be a cliche. And yet, this is one sector that surely merits this description. Ekene Ezeji, reporting for Mona Lisa on Plus TV Africa. So, I'm sure you gained some enlightenment from that inside view. Now to unbundle and explore the issues touched in the report with our chief guests. Welcome to Mona Lisa, Captain John Ojikutu. Yeah, so you have been in the industry, in the industry of air travel for over three decades. Um, can you walk us through what the experiences has been like? I was a military airport commandant at Morita Lama Media Airport about the time there was a problem in Liberia and Syria alone, and we had to move troops to Ekumog mm -hmm. with, with some logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, we were short of aircraft about that time, so we had to fall back on some of the civil aircrafts. And uh, quite a number of airlines came to the rescue of government that time. We had airline like Okada, okay. 
we had Cabo, we had a Triax. Triax? Triax. Mm -hmm. Triax was owned by Atoese. Mm -hmm. We had Das, owned by a Kenyan. It was a cargo plane. Mm -hmm. We had Gas. Mm -hmm. So these were the planes that these people were using. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a lot of them in, uh, in different types. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the Bakwani lane, which was very common, like the 737 we are flying today. Mm -hmm. We had a 727. Mm -hmm. We had a 707. And at a particular stage, Okara had to bring in his uh, new 747. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably, if I can remember very well, it was only the Akumog operation that uh, Okara was able to use the 747. Mm -hmm. And he used it excessively mm -hmm. for us, and uh, it paid off. So what I'm saying is that uh, that was what exposed me to the management of uh, private airlines in this country. A lot of them came into operation about that time mm -hmm. because of the liberalization of aviation, the liberalization of government policy about that time to bring in a private airline. And they made a lot of money. The question I ask is that why did they die? Yes. A lot of private airline operators come into the system without a thorough knowledge of the market. An average Nigerian businessman wants to make maximum profit. Aviation is never like that. Aviation is little profit. Initially, you might be making the money and it looks as if it is a profit. But because, like we always say, it is a regulated um, it's a regulated business. And when I say regulated, it is not only national regulated, but internationally regulated. Because you could have 10, 20 aircrafts. One, if all of them are flying, good for you. If all of them are not flying, because the aircraft is supposed to be in the air. If a lot of them are on the ground, then you have a problem. Because whether they fly or not, a particular time will come, they will require maintenance. Sir, it has nothing to do with the cumbersome taxes that has been um, uh, meted on uh, private um, airline owners. It has nothing to do with that? Very little to do with that. I hear a lot of noise and claims by people either within or outside talking about uh, taxes. And I ask, what are those taxes? They've listed about 32 of them. And I have checked through for operating airlines that are operating. I don't call them taxes. They are charges. The charges are between the various agencies. For instance, the charges on passengers, they call it passenger service charge. And I tell them, it's not for the airline. It's for the passenger to pay. Initially, I don't know, initially FAN was collecting this money directly from the passengers. But it was becoming a problem. It's an arrangement between FAN and the airline. The airline collects and make a return back to, to FAN. Air tickets, and that's another area. I keep telling any airline, if you are flying one hour flight in this country and you are collecting less than $100, then you can make it. Why? One hundred dollars from here to Abuja. Yes. Thirty-six thousand. Yeah, thirty-six thousand. Why? Is that? Look at the operational cost. There is nowhere outside. When people say that it's hard there, it's hard there. Just love at them. So, sir, you're saying now that ordinary citizens like me, like the, like the masses, would all just resort to road transportation since they can't cater for, for as long as the air transport services is being managed and regulated. It's not about it. So why can't we go back and have our own national carrier? What is that exactly is the question? Is the challenge? That is the question everybody keeps asking. Let's look, go back to the history of what we call national carrier or national carriers before. There was Nigerian Airways. Yes. There was Ghana Airways. There was Cameroon Airways. There was Air Zaire. There was Air Africa. The question is what killed them? The same way the Nigerian will. It's the attitude of those in government in all these various countries. It is the attitude of African leaders in all these countries. All of them went down at about the same time. Is it about greed? Is corruption. It about corruption. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And again, people in government believe that what you call national carrier is a government carrier, and it's meant for them. So, sir, what changes are needed to take us to the next level? You talked about us concentrating on what concerns us. Yeah. Let me put it this way. We just have to be very serious with ourselves. So what is the problem? First and foremost, let the regulator, let him do his work. We have about 22 airports in this country. You must start from there. Make them functional for at least 18 hours a day. The airlines that are crying they won't government money, they can do better than what they are doing. In the evening, we have a lot of buses that are going to the east. You understand? Reconfigure aircraft to carry cargo and passenger. At least you still believe in the, in the sector. No, 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 I do. Hmm. I seriously do. I believe in the... <laughs> I believe in the national carrier, but it's not government airline, like I always tell yes, you. It's it not is. a government airline bringing technical partner, giving 40 to 50 percent share. Call the Dangotis, call the Emeka of Falls, call the Hotel Dollar, call all of them, and uh, let them buy into it. Give them 20 to 25 percent. Let government, federal government and state government, not more than. 10%. Then you and I will go to the stock market and buy the balance. Nothing like taking advantage of the knowledge that experience brings. Now, to glean even more knowledge from the wealth of experience of our next guest on the journey. Prepare to be engaged on this edition of the journey as we join Air Vice Marshal Felix Olufemi Gbadebo, a retired military officer who once held command at the highest level in the Nigerian Air Force. Along with his wife, he is the founder of the Banola Initiative. ABM, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hmm. I've read so much about you in three days. <laughs> I dug deep and deep and deep. And I realize that you're well-traveled. Uh, you've been everywhere. <laughs> and I want to ask you, how has this experiences, experience of yours, how has it shaped your life thus far? Well, um, I'll say that part of the gains of traveling is you see how societies are shaped by visionary leaders, mm -hmm. how um, things are made to benefit people. You have social welfare systems in the UK, in America, and some of the developed countries. Mm -hmm. But you also have a situation where the government um, stands to ensure that nobody lives uh, below what we call extreme poverty lines here. And that is one of the things that disturbs one about mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria. Way, we failed to do certain things when we should have done that. And that is to create a kind of social welfare system or socialist state. And so we ended up with a, a welfare de a dependent state where everybody depends on their brother or relation who is in position. And so every time somebody gets a position, be it my manager of a company or mm. governor of a state or president, the entire relations now believe that his duty is to provide for them. And it has created a very serious problem for us. Wow. Okay, let's talk about um, your initiative, which is called Benola. Um, is it Benola Foundation Benola or Benola Cerebral Cerebral Pulse Initiative? Sorry. Let's talk about that. Mm. How did that come about? Uh, my wife and I, we have a son who was born in uh, 1996, premature, and very quickly we discovered that he had some development disabilities. It took us almost a year to confirm uh, that the problem was cerebral palsy because doctors would say, look, yeah, there's some problem with the child. He's not feeling normally. He can hold his neck steady. He can do one or two things, but with time, it will be, not, it will be okay. It took someone to come visit us at a time in Lagos to say, no, this is not right. Mm -hmm. The woman herself had a child who had Down syndrome, so it was easy for her to pick Detect. this thing out. Mm -hmm. And she said, look, take this child to a neurologist and look at it. And then the neurologist did his test and he gave us the name which we had never heard of before, cerebral palsy. Um, and he said something. He said, 
don't go running from pillar to post. It has no cure. And of course, we ran from pillar to post and looked for alternatives. We were able to go to Germany. Uh, my wife was there for about five months, hmm. came back, and it was confirmed, yes, he has cerebral palsy, it has no cure. And we managed him extensively until I retired at uh, 2008. He was 12 years old. A friend of mine who is a medical doctor, when he noticed that my wife and I, we talk extensively about our son. You don't meet us for five minutes and you're not hearing about him, unlike most people who want to hide the fact they have this issue or another. And he said, look, you need to do something about this, set up an NGO. And then he said, well, you don't have to set up a home or a school. You can set up an initiative. And that's when I realized, OK, I used to be flying instructor. I've been teaching all my life. Uh, I talk a lot. <laughs> and that is my gambit. So hmm. we built our capacity to be sure we knew what we were talking about. And we started to run an advocacy campaign. Mm. How were you able to navigate the financial challenge? Basically, I had just retired. I had my, um, my gratuity okay. and uh, a little bit of money I'd set behind. I knew what I wanted to do. And so um, we spent a lot of our money. Mm. In the process, of course, a few of our friends uh, helped. You see, when you set up an NGO, especially when you have um, a situation that affects you, Friends would humor you. I like to Not, use that it's word. Just usually, it's natural. With yes, them. they'll humor wow. you for a year or two mm. because they expect that you know it's a fad that will blow away. Um, after the second year, when it's not blowing away, some of them begin to withdraw, and that's when issue of funding starts becoming a problem. Um, by the time we're in the third year, um, we were expecting to blow. That is like we have really arrived. We have a very vibrant website. Everything we were doing was really different. And then we ran into a brick wall. And then there was this friend of mine again, this doctor. And I talked to him and he said, Avian, God is never broke. Hmm. And that word has stuck with me till hmm. today. He said, go to his people. Just go out. I have a lot of friends on social media, WhatsApp, Instagram. Uh, Facebook, etc. So I started a campaign, and that is what has sustained Benola up till today. How has um, well have parents so far been responding? Have they been responsive? Well, for instance, in 2012, when we started the program, um, no media house in Nigeria could show the picture of a cerebral palsy child. Um, a few times they'll talk about it, they'll have a picture of a, of a white child. And so I decided on our website and everything that we were going to use only Nigerian children. And that's what you still find on our website. It was a bit of a problem initially. Even the first time we went to Moduke Cole, they wouldn't allow us to take cameras around. But we tried to educate people that, look, People cannot help you without, without seeing yes, what the problem visual, is. Yes, visual, you know, that's sensible and so, um, message we faster. Are, we, we, we started working, and little by little, parents started to send us pictures of their children. Mm. And now, honestly speaking, there are lots of parents who are very positive about their children. Fantastic. Somehow, families outside or individuals outside have caught the vision. Uh, we have a lady in Jos who has cerebral palsy, and we made her an ambassador of Benola in 2013. And she's so proud of her job. She's about 40 now, 41. And, um, you know, she has biannual programs for cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, she launched a foundation and invited me just last month to come and be the guest speaker at a family forum where she had over 70 parents, hmm. um, which is really remarkable. Uh, there is a lady in Uma here. She's a medical doctor who also launched um, a program on cerebral palsy, and mm. she now runs a radio station. She invited me in 2017 to uh, be there. there. There's a young lady who just started something in Bida. She came for our program. We had a program uh, just this Saturday mm -hmm. uh, where we had over 200 CP families and other people. Um, it's growing. The program we had on Saturday was specifically for families. And I'll tell you that Lagos University Teaching Hospital in the last three years have collaborated with us. So we use one of their media halls 
and as many as 50 of their experts, from physiotherapy to pediatrics to nutrition and all, come there and volunteer free consultation. Oh. One of the reasons why we hold the Family Forum is that we have found over the years of working with families that the children with disabilities are not a problem. Everybody focuses on those children, but the real problem are the parents and the siblings. They are the ones who have to care for these children. They are the ones who have to sacrifice their time, their resources, and everything. So they are the ones that need the greatest help. And then that's why we, government must figure out how to come in, how to open up the place. We must create access. My son is unique because mm. he has taught me so many things. Mm. You know, when somebody stays in a room virtually all day, and remains positive about life. He's always cheerful, he blows kisses, he... Um, in fact, when you're with him, you have a you have problem leaving. <laughs> you understand? I'm always impressed when people can look beyond their challenges to become a source of hope for others. Thank you, Air Vice Marshal Badebo, for coming to the show. This has been so incisive. I'm so emotional, I don't know what to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. At a time where we are seeing the first female chief pilot in a mainstream airline, we're having to reflect on the colorful track record of the Nigerian aviation sector and to ask if we are finally set to reach greater altitudes in this unrealized industry. The appeal of the aviation sector for some is a promise of undiscovered terrain. Our aviation sector smacks of that promise. There is this undeniable demand for travel amidst a burgeoning population that makes up the nation of Nigeria. Yes, the fact that we are yet to re-establish a national career is evidence of a milestone yet unattained. Against the odds, we have a private sector that is recording increasing sales and even profits, especially at the festive season. The challenge is therefore how we match supply to demand in a sector that is second only to road transportation in its popularity. Group Captain Ojikutsu believes this target is achievable and FAN, Federal Aviation Authority of Nigeria, are committed to making our aviation industry amongst the best in the world. It is then down to a combined application of policy enforcement and health competition in this sector to ensure that we establish and promote this much needed service to a broader clientele. With all of this in place, as the saying goes, the sky needn't be our limit. As limitless as we sometimes wish our time with you is, I have to admit that we have reached our destination on this edition. Till next time, when we'll be exploring new terrain from fresh perspectives, stay as curious and unpresumptuous as a child. Life has so much to teach us.